Hello, AP Stat students, and welcome to AP Daily Live Review, session number six. I'm Darren Starnes, and I'm looking forward to talking with you today about rubrics for free response success. In the previous session, Mr. Wilcox talked with you about three very helpful tools for success on the AP exam. And today we're going to shift our focus more specifically onto the free response questions. So with that, uh, let me share out my presentation and we'll just do a few logistical reminders. Uh, first thing uh, to remind you about, we have materials for the session available at this tiny URL address. And if you've been joining us already, you'll know that the session six handout will be located there along with the formula sheet and the tables that are the same as the ones you will see on the AP exam. I also wanna remind you that over the weekend, Mr. Wilcox and I added a file, an alignment of all of the AP statistics uh, live review questions to the AP daily videos. So you'll see that one as a Google sheet in the top of the folder. Uh, so if you see one of the questions tonight and you feel like you need to have a little more explanation or review of some part of one of the questions, you can go into that document and see which question uh, you want to have further clarification on and then drill down to the specific uh, AP Daily Live Review video that you uh, that you need to go and see. So this is session six and just want to remind you that that resource is there for you. Another important resource as always will be our graphing calculator. Uh, I'm going to be using a TI-84 uh, emulator during this session. You are welcome to use uh, whichever one you're planning on having on the AP exam day. And on that subject, you do need to be prepared with a graphing calculator on AP exam day. Uh, that is an expectation. Uh, you wanna have those statistical capabilities, uh, which hopefully you've had um, during your course this year. And a reminder that at the end of this session, uh, I'll be soliciting your feedback via a Google form, things that went well, any further questions you have or suggestions for the next session. Speaking of feedback, uh, here's a little bit of uh, response to feedback from session four, the last time that I was with you. Uh, one question that a student asked, uh, how should we answer a free response question when using a calculator to perform calculations? That's actually a really good question. So on the free response, uh, I've broken my answer into two parts. If the free response question is asking you to do a probability calculation, like a binomial or geometric or normal distribution problem. You can either show the formula for that type of probability calculation with numbers plugged in, or you can use the calculator command with all the inputs labeled, for example, binome CDF trials 10, P 1 4th, X value five, but you have to label all those inputs and that would count as your work on that type of question. The second type is inference calculations. That is when you're doing a confidence interval or a significance test on the pre-response. You can either, again, show formulas with the numbers plugged in as your work or mechanics, or you can give the result directly from the calculator. That is, write down the confidence interval, or write down the test statistic and the p-value, plus any degrees of freedom that might be applicable to that type of procedure. And in the process, if you're using the calculator, it's a good idea to write down the name of the actual procedure you used, like 2SAMP t-test, for example. Next question, can I pass the AP exam if I don't master probability or binomial distribution, or if I don't learn it completely? That's a fair, fair question. Uh, yes, but I would say keep working to try to master some more probability before the exam. Don't give up this early. Another question that came in from the previous session, uh, for inference about means, what graphs can you use to check the normal condition when the sample size is small and less than 30, let's say? Uh, I did an example of a two sample t-test for a difference in means and had small sample sizes in both groups. And the answer to this one is you can use a dot plot, a stem plot, histogram, a box plot, or a type of graph that's not even on the AP statistics course and exam description called a normal probability plot that you may have learned in your course. Any of those are 
perfectly uh, good graphs to use to discuss why you do believe that the population distribution is approximately normal. And a warm fuzzy from last time uh, for Mr. Wilcox and I, best review sessions out of any of the AP courses, very effective. So thank you to, uh, to that kind student. Uh, and uh, the final question I wanted to share, could we see a copy of the rubric for the free response questions? I thought you'd never ask. That's what we're gonna see this entire session. So thank you for your feedback. We are reading it and we're trying to respond uh, in our follow-up sessions. Uh, so please, again, at the end of the session, uh, let me know what you thought and follow up with any questions you might still have. Today, what are we gonna learn? Well, hopefully you're gonna learn something about becoming successful on the free response questions using rubrics or scoring guidelines. So the plan for this session we're going to work through three free response questions from previous AP exams on different topics. I've picked exploring data, collecting data, and inference. I did not pick probability this time. I did one of those in an earlier session. Um, these are all from previous AP exams, and they all highlight really important concepts and skills. And along the way, we're going to review the scoring guidelines, which I'll sometimes call rubrics for short, and we'll use student responses to illustrate what's required to earn full credit, but also to highlight some common errors. We have our goals that are the same throughout these sessions. Help you simplify challenging content, share strategies for AP exam success, and continue to build your confidence. So let's do it. We're going to start with a free response question about exploring data. The Great Plains Railroad is interested in studying how fuel consumption is related to the number of rail cars on its trains on a certain route between Oklahoma City and Omaha. A random sample of 10 trains on this route has yielded the data in the table below. And you can see here we have number of rail cars and fuel consumption in units per mile. A scatter plot, a residual plot, and the output from the reg regression analysis for these data are shown below. So I'm highlighting some key words as I'm reading actively. The random sample of 10 trains sounded pretty important. So here we see the scatter plot, the residual plot, and the regression output from Elise Square's uh, regression analysis on the computer. And our first part of the question, is a linear model appropriate for modeling these data? Appropriate. Clearly explain your reasoning. So for a linear model to be appropriate, we need to think about what that is asking. Here's a sample student response. Yes, a linear model is appropriate because the original data appears linear and the residuals appear randomly distributed with no shape or bending. Now I'm gonna show you the scoring guideline for this part. Part A is essentially correct. That's the best you can get on any part or section of a question. Uh, we label that as just E for essentially correct. If the model is deemed appropriate and the explanation clearly indicates first that there is a linear pattern in the scatter plot or there is no pattern in the residual plot. So we're now going to look back at the sample student response and see how this would be scored. Well, the student said yes, a linear model is appropriate. So that definitely addresses the first component to get the essentially correct. Now, what's their justification? Well, first they say, because the original data appears linear. Now, please don't read into what the student is saying. They're saying the data appears linear. They didn't say that the scatter plot appears linear. I know that sounds a little picky, but we can only judge as AP readers what the student writes on the paper. We're not quite sure what the student means by the data appears linear. So we're not counting that as a reference to the scatter plot. It's also not necessarily incorrect. It's just ambiguous. Let's keep reading. And the residuals appear randomly distributed with no shape or bending. So that is an attempt to say there is no pattern in the residual plot. If the residuals appear randomly scattered around the zero line or horizontal line at zero, and there's no sort of 
shape like a curve, I guess, bending, uh, that's equivalent to no pattern in the residual plot. So this student gets credit for the second of those two bullets and therefore an essentially correct. But I thought you'd wanna see that that underlined orange uh, phrase was not enough. All right, let's continue. Part B, suppose the fuel consumption cost is $25 per unit. Give a point estimate, a single value, for the change in the average cost of fuel per mile for each additional rail car attached to a train. Show your work. Now, just a comment. This part actually says to show your work. That's a little uncommon on AP exam free response questions because at the beginning of the section, there's a set of directions that says, show all your work. So don't expect to see show your work uh, written next to anything where you need to show work. It's already been stated in the directions at the beginning of the free response section. Just wanted to point that out. All right, uh, what occurred to me as I was reading through that and what I hope occurred to some of you is that that sounds like something related to the slope. Change in average cost of fuel per mile for each additional rail car. It sounds like that's connected to like change in Y over change in X or rate of change. So I'm looking at the computer output here and I've, I've boxed in um, the coefficient of rail car in the equation, which is also in this case given up above uh, is about 2.15, but the slope of this regression line is 2.1495. And so we need to think about how that connects. Well, here's what the student wrote. Fuel consumption equals 10.677. Notice they use the, the coefficient here for the y-intercept plus 2.1495 rail cars. Just a comment, that equation is not quite right. This is actually the predicted fuel consumption. So in an ideal world, uh, let me just uh, get my pen going here. In an ideal world, we would have had some kind of uh, demarcation above that uh, fuel consumption line, maybe a, uh, a hat or a carrot or something. All right, for every additional rail car, 2.1495 additional units of fuel per mile is used. 2.1495 times 25 equals $53.74 increase in cost of fuel per mile for each additional car. So here's the scoring guideline. Part B is essentially correct, E, if the point estimate for the slope, 2.15 or 2.1495, and the fuel consumption cost per unit, $25, are used to calculate the correct point estimate, $53.75 or thereabouts. So now let's look back at the student solution. Did they use the slope correctly to calculate the predicted um, average increase in average cost of fuel per mile for each additional rail car? They did. They got $53.74. So the student gets an essentially correct. Well done. So far, that's two parts essentially correct. All right, part C. Interpret the value of R squared in the context of this problem. I know, I can't see all of you, but I know some of you are sweating already just to hear interpreting the value of R squared, sometimes called the coefficient of determination. This has plagued students on many previous exam questions because the wording is a little awkward. So we got to interpret and we're after R squared. Up in the computer output there, it's labeled R squared equals 96.7%. So we we know where to look. Here's what this student wrote. 96.7% of the variation in fuel consumption is explained by the change in number of rail cars. Here's the scoring guideline. Part C is essentially correct, E, if the student states, 96.7% of the variation in fuel consumption is explained by the linear regression model, that would be optimal, or at a minimum, I will say, 96.7% of the variation in fuel consumption is explained by the number of rail cars. So the optimal one is the first one. The one on the bottom is not quite as good because there's no reference to the linear model that's being used to connect these two variables. So let's uh, look at the student's response again in light of the, the scoring guidelines. 96.7% uh, of the variation in fuel consumption, that's good. 
uh, is explained by the change in number of rail cars. Well, that's sort of like the second version here by the number of rail cars. It's not quite the first version, the linear regression model relating to number of rail cars, but it's sufficient uh, for an essentially correct on this particular problem. So we always wanna aim for the optimal because we don't know if the scoring guidelines are gonna be uh, lenient if we do something that's not quite optimal. Like always aim high, and then if the scoring guideline's a little bit generous, we'll be thankful for that. Now, there are a few other numbers on this computer output that might be of interest. One is this S, that's the standard deviation of the residuals. So a uh, size of a typical prediction error when using this model to predict fuel consumption uh, based on number of rail cars would be about 4.361 units of fuel. That would be the size of a typical prediction error. In a previous session, we looked at the standard error of the slope, uh, which is here, the 0.1396, uh, when we were calculating a confidence interval for the slope of a regression line. All right, let's uh, go on to part D, the final part. Would it be reasonable to use the fitted regression equation to predict the fuel consumption for a train on this route if the train had 65 rail cars? Explain. Would it be reasonable? Okay, so that's the key word. And 65 rail cars sounds important. The student says, no, I do not believe this would be appropriate. Any extrapolation should be used with caution. And since 65 is so far away from the closest observed value, 50, I do not feel we can assume it would be accurate. Okay. The scoring guideline, part D is essentially correct, E, if the students state that this is unreasonable due to extrapolation. No. And now the word extrapolation does not have to appear in the response. The idea of extrapolation has to be explained in the response. So the student uh, went on to say, since 65 is so far away from the closest observed value, that's what extrapolation is. It's using your model to predict outside the domain of the X values that were used to create it. So that was another essentially correct response. So how do we score overall since each part is scored essentially correct or partially correct or incorrect? Well, in this particular problem, an essentially correct uh, part counts as one point, a partially correct counts as half a point, and an incorrect counts as no points. And we just add them together. So this student got the highest possible, essentially corrects on all four. That's one point each for a score of four. Now you'll notice at the bottom, if a response is in between two scores, like two and a half, a holistic approach is used to determine whether the response is developing or substantial. And criteria are given to the exam readers to help them decide based on communication uh, and quality of statistical thinking, which of those uh, is appropriate on a given question. So that completes our first free response question. We're now moving to one about collecting data. One of my favorite problems, actually. Here we go. As dogs age, diminished joint and hip health may lead to joint pain and thus reduce a dog's activity level. Such a reduction in activity can lead to other health concerns, such as weight gain and lethargy due to lack of exercise. A study is to be conducted to see which of two dietary supplements, glucosamine or chondroitin, is more effective in promoting joint and hip health and reducing the onset of canine osteoarthritis. Researchers will randomly select a total of 300 dogs from 10 different large veterinary practices around the country. All of the dogs are more than six years old and their owners have given consent to participate in the study. Changes in joint and hip health will be evaluated after six months of treatment. And you can see this is a three-part question. So we're gonna delve into each part individually. Here goes, part A. What would be an advantage to adding a control group in the design of this study? Keywords there, advantage and control group. Well, here's the student's response. An advantage to adding a control group to this design would be that it gives the experiment something to compare its results to, to see how much of a difference the treatments make. Here's the scoring guideline. 
Part A is scored as essentially correct, E, if an advantage of using a comparison group is described in the context of this study. Well, here's an advantage of using a control group. It gives you a baseline for comparing results of the glucosamine and the chondroitin. That's good. In the context of this study, I don't see anything in there about glucosamine, chondroitin, dogs, or anything else. I, I think, um, I don't know. I don't think they got context. So part A is scored as partially correct if an advantage of using a control group is described, but not in the context of the study. Jackpot, this is a partially correct. You have to include context in your responses on these free response questions. Let's go to part B. Assuming a control group is added to the other two groups in the study, explain how you would assign the 300 dogs to these three groups for a completely randomized design. Here's the student's uh, attempt to do those things. For every dog that is chosen, roll a die. If the die is a one or two, give the dog the glucosamine. If the die is a three or four, give the dog the chondroitin. If the die is a five or six, put the dog in the control group. This will completely randomize the design. Let's look at the scoring guidelines. Part B is scored as essentially correct, E, if randomization is used correctly, and the method of randomization can be implemented after reading the student response so that two knowledgeable statistics users would use the same method to assign dogs to treatment groups. Well, this student clearly indicates that each dog gets a die roll and they have an equal chance of going into any of the three groups completely at random. Now, a comment, it may be the case, in fact, it'll likely be the case that the three groups will end up with different numbers of dogs. It won't come out exactly 100, 100, and 100 because the luck of the die roll, but it's still completely randomized. And it doesn't say that there had to be an equal number of dogs per group. So this is essentially correct. Be careful when you see questions like this, because in some cases, the randomization procedure will require that you put the same number of individuals or uh, experimental units into each group. If that were the case, then the die roll method would not work uh, as well. So essentially correct for this student, uh, doing well so far on this question. Now part C, rather than using a completely randomized design, one group of researchers proposes blocking on clinics and another group of researchers proposes blocking on breed of dog. How would you decide which one of these two variables to use as a blocking variable? And here's the student's response. I would decide to use the blocking on breed of dog. Well, they've made their choice. The clinic the dog is in should not affect the medicine the dog is given. However, different breeds of dogs might respond to the medicines differently. Therefore, the blocking on breed of dog should be used. Let's look at the scoring guideline. Part C is scored as essentially correct E if the student argues that the variable with the stronger relationship to joint and hip health should be used as the blocking variable. Well, they've picked the blocking variable they believe should be used. And they've said that different breeds of dogs might respond to the medicines differently, but I don't see where they have ruled out um, the clinic being related to the joint and hip health. Hmm. Because maybe particular clinics deal with dogs that have certain types of joint and hip health problems. They did address the clinic in regard to the medicine being randomly assigned, but that's not the same as the response variable. So I think we may need to look at the partially correct here. If the student does not acknowledge more variability associated in the response variable with one of the variables, breed or clinic, uh, than the other. So in this case, the student is going to earn the partially correct because they did not make the choice based on uh, greater variability due to breed of dog with respect to joint and hip health as compared to the clinic. Now, block design is a really challenging idea. Some of you asked questions about it after a previous session where Mr. Wilcox did a question about randomized block design. So here's another opportunity to uh, look at it. This was one of the most challenging questions for students uh, about randomized block design. So let's take account of what this student has uh, earned 
So at the end of the question, we've got scores for each of the parts or components. And now we have this translation guide to get a four or a complete response, the student would have to get all three parts essentially correct. And if you've been with me, you know that didn't happen. So unfortunately, they're gonna be in one of the lower uh, score categories, but this student earned an essentially correct followed by two partially corrects. Well, to get a substantial response, you have to have two parts essentially correct and one part partially correct in any order. And that's not what the student did. They have an E and two Ps. So that puts them in the developing response uh, category, one part essentially correct and two parts partially correct. You can see that there are other ways to get a developing response, two E's and an I, or all three P's. So I've shown you an example with a four uh, component or section scoring and now an example with a three component or section scoring. Those are two of the very common uh, sets of scoring guidelines that we use on the free response questions. All right, so we've done one with exploring data and one with collecting data. It's time for inference. Here we go. A researcher conducted a medical study to investigate whether taking a low dose aspirin reduces the chance of developing colon cancer. As part of the study, a thousand adult volunteers were randomly assigned to one of two groups. Half of the volunteers were assigned to the experimental group that took a low dose aspirin each day, and the other half were assigned to the control group that took a placebo each day. At the end of six years, 15 of the people who took the low dose aspirin had developed colon cancer, and 26 of the people who took the placebo had developed colon cancer. At the significance level, alpha equals 0 0.05. Do the data provide convincing statistical evidence that taking a low dose aspirin each day would reduce the chance of developing colon cancer among all people similar to the volunteers. Here's the student's response to step one uh, in the scoring. They're stating their hypotheses. So let's see what they've written here. P1 equals the true proportion of people who took medicine and get colon cancer. P2 equals true proportion of people who took placebo and get colon cancer. Alpha equals 0 0.05. H0, P1 equals P2. HA, P1 less than P2. Let's look at the scoring guidelines. Essentially correct E if the response identifies correct parameters and both hypotheses are labeled and state the correct relationship between the parameters. Partially correct P if the response identifies correct parameters or states correct relationships, but not both. Let's apply these to the student's response. Well, we have a bit of an issue in the definition of the parameters. Although they both say true proportion, they also go on to say who took medicine. The only people who took medicine were the people in the experiment, that is the sample. So the reference to took medicine and took placebo makes this unfortunately refer to the sample. If it's the true proportion of people who would take medicine and get colon cancer or would take placebo and get colon cancer, that takes it out of the realm of being the sample into this larger hypothetical group. So that's unfortunately gonna be an incorrect parameter definition. The hypotheses are stated correctly. The null hypothesis is there's no difference in the true proportions. And the alternative hypothesis is that uh, a smaller proportion uh, of those who took the medicine would get colon cancer than uh, the proportion of those who took placebo. So that's a partially correct. We'll move on to the second step in the scoring, which is the identification of the procedure and the checking of the conditions. So this response says, if conditions are met, we will use a two sample Z test for proportions. Random, 1000 adult volunteers were randomly assigned to one of two groups, check. Normal, 26, 474, 15, 485 are all greater than or equal to 10, check. Independent, there are at least 1,000 times 10 equals 10,000 people similar to volunteers. Check. Let's look at the scoring guidelines. Well, it's essentially correct if the response correctly includes the following three components. We're going to look at each one individually. We have to have the identification of the correct test procedure by name or by formula. Okay, so they could 
identify the test procedure using a formula, um, which we'll see in the mechanics step next. This student says, if conditions are met, we will use a two sample Z test for proportions. Now it really should be two sample Z test for a difference in proportions, but the calculator calls it a two prop Z test. So we've got two sample and we've got Z and we've got proportions, that's adequate. Next, this uh, response has to note that the use of random assignment is what satisfies the randomness condition. That's what was used in the study. There was no random sampling at all, just volunteers who were randomly assigned to the treatment groups. The student says a thousand volunteers were randomly assigned to one of two groups. That's very nice. And the third thing is the response needs to check for approximate normality by citing that all four of the expected counts based on the null hypothesis being true are larger than or equal to say five or 10. Well, this student says 26, 474, 15, and 485 are all greater than or equal to 10. The 15 and the 26 are the numbers of successes, the people who got colon cancer, and the other two numbers are the people who did not get colon cancer in each of those two groups of 500 volunteers. Those are not the expected counts if the null hypothesis is true. Those are the observed counts. That's not the correct way to check conditions for a two-sample z-test for a difference in proportions. The students should be using the combined or overall proportion of successes because the null hypothesis is that there's no difference in the effectiveness of these two uh, drugs, placebo or uh, the uh, low-dose aspirin. And in that case, the overall proportion of subjects who got colon cancer was uh, 15 plus 26 over 1,000 or 0 0.041. That's the number the student should be using to calculate these expected numbers of successes and failures in each group. So the student should have done 500 times 0 0.041 to get the expected number of successes in the uh, placebo group. And then they should have done uh, 1,000, sorry, 500 times 0.959 to get the number of failures expected in the placebo group and so on. So we can't give them credit uh, for doing the normal check in the way they were intended to. Uh, partially correct if the response correctly includes only two of the three components. Well, they did get the identification and they did do the random assignment correctly. So it looks like we might be at a partial. Now I haven't addressed the fourth item up there. There's another statement that says independent. There are at least a thousand times 10 equals 10,000 people similar to the volunteers. They're checking the 10% condition for independent observations, but there was no random sampling here. This is not appropriate. So on a scoring guideline, it's possible that there could be an instruction that says something like, if a student checks an inappropriate condition, such as the 10% or independent observations condition, and they were going to get an essentially correct, go ahead and deduct down to a partially correct. It's also possible that the same scoring guideline could say, if the student has a partially correct and they do something like check the 10% or independent condition when there's no random sampling, knock them down to an incorrect, that's less common, but I'd hate to risk it. So it's important to know which conditions need to be checked. We always need random data production and we always need the distribution to have the proper form. So something about normal or large counts when we're dealing with inference about proportions or means. Um, the 10% condition needs to be checked only when there's random sampling without replacement from a finite population. Let's move on to the mechanics or the calculations. So this student drew uh, what looks like a normal curve. They labeled a Z value, negative 1.7542, and they got a P of 0 0.0394. Now, I don't know how they got it. There's no indication of that. Um, I have some ideas of how they might have gotten it. Uh, I think they might have used their calculator and plugged in to the appropriate uh, procedure like stat and then tests and then two proportion Z test. And then we just need the number of successes and failures. Uh, there were 15 successes in the one group 
and uh, let me make sure 26 uh, in the other group. And less than is our alternative hypothesis direction. If we calculate that, we get a Z statistic negative 1.754 and a P value of 0 0.0397, something like that. They got a slightly different P value. Um, the nice thing on the AP statistics exam that's different from AP calculus is we don't focus on number of decimal places that need to be correct, uh, but we need it to be pretty darn close. So 0.0394 is pretty darn close, but there's obviously a slight um, error of some kind there. Uh, and unless it's a noticeable deviation, that would probably still be acceptable. I'd hate to risk it. Uh, you know, you'd like to get it correct. Uh, but most likely that would be, uh, no, it wasn't essentially correct. So now uh, essentially correct requires the response to correctly calculate both the test statistic and a p-value that's consistent with their stated alternative. The student did that up to a maybe small mistake in that fourth decimal place. So this was essentially correct. Of course, some of you know that there's the option of using the uh, formula. And so if we were going to do that, we might want to consult with our formula sheet and look down for the uh, inference. Here's the formula for our standardized test statistic, statistic minus parameter over standard error of the statistic. And then we need to look for a difference in proportions. Uh, that would be here. And the appropriate um, standard error that we're going to use when P1 equals P2 is assumed, that's the null hypothesis in this case, then this is the formula we would use for the standard error where p hat c is the combined or overall proportion of successes in the two groups that I showed earlier, 0 0.041. So this is the correct formula for the denominator for the standard error. And you could take that uh, combined proportion p hat and plug in uh, the difference in the two sample proportions. I'll just mention minus the null difference of zero over the standard error, uh, which was the formula I just showed you there and get negative 1.75 that way. And then you could get the p-value either from uh, the tables that are provided uh, using table A, or you could get it from uh, the calculator using normal CDF. But this student's done all they needed to. They've provided the correct test statistic and p-value. The final step, we have to make a conclusion. Let's see what the student says. Because the p-value is less than alpha, 0.0397, is less than 0.05. Now, hang on a second. It was 0 0.0394 over here. I'm wondering if maybe they just made a little transcription error because 0 0.0397 is the correct number. That makes me feel a little bit better about giving that last section a, an essentially correct. Uh, because the p-value is less than alpha, it is statistically significant. We have sufficient evidence to conclude that taking a low-dose aspirin each day would reduce the chance of developing colon cancer among all people similar to the volunteers. Notice this student is using the wording of the question to make sure their wording addresses the question. That's a really smart strategy. Uh, then the wording doesn't get all tangled up when you try to freelance it. So the model uh, says uh, from the scoring guideline, essentially correct. E, if the response provides a correct conclusion in context with justification based on linkage, linkage excuse me, between the p-value and the given alpha of 0 0.05. Well, there's the linkage, p-value less than alpha. We have sufficient evidence, and we have the conclusion in context. Taking a low-dose aspirin each day would reduce the chance of developing colon cancer among all people similar to the volunteers. That's the limit of our scope of inference because these were volunteers. Uh, we did not randomly select these individuals uh, from a larger population and then randomly assign them. So essentially correct for the fourth step. Let's uh, tally it up here. This is another of those four section or four component rubrics. And so each E counts as one, each P or partial counts as a half, and each incorrect would count as zero. So this student has a P, P, E, E. That looks like three or a substantial response. And as you think back at this, uh, about this student's paper, it was a substantial response. The mistakes that they made were relatively minor in the scheme of things, and they obviously demonstrated 
uh, reasonable or complete knowledge on each of the four uh, components or steps of the problem. So this is a good example of uh, how you can get a nice substantial response with a couple of little minor uh, errors or issues along the way. So what should you take away from this uh, discussion of free response questions and scoring guidelines? Well, your rubrics for free response success uh, are based on using the content that you've learned this year. First, we learned that if you need to determine whether a linear model is appropriate, you need to look at graphical evidence, the scatter plot or the residual plot. That's the only way to know if the linear model rather than a curved model of some kind is appropriate. It's no good quoting uh, numerical values when you're looking for model appropriateness. You looked at how to interpret computer regression output. You need to feel comfortable interpreting the slope or the y-intercept uh, or the slope again or r-squared uh, or the standard deviation of residuals or even the standard error of the slope how much the sample slopes tend to vary from the true slope of the population regression line and repeated randomness, whether it's random sampling or random assignment. We reminded you to avoid extrapolation going beyond the domain of the data used to create the model. And we delve deep into the experimental design vocabulary control group. Uh, replication is one that might come up using enough subjects in each group so that you're able to determine whether one treatment is more effective uh, blinding. Uh, we didn't talk about blinding on the dog study. Uh, I, I don't, I don't want to go there, but uh, with humans, you, you need to think about the subjects and the, uh, the researchers who interact with them, not knowing who is receiving which treatment, if that's possible. Blocking, we definitely addressed, and we talked a little bit uh, about uh, placebo. Uh, now, whether dogs have a placebo effect is also open for further discussion, uh, but we're not going to have it here. We talked about how to describe random sampling or random assignment. You need to be prepared to do that, uh, either uh, using random digits or perhaps uh, drawing slips of paper that are well mixed out of a hat, or perhaps even rolling dice if you don't need to guarantee equal sized groups. So strategies, always answer your questions in context. You saw an example where a student didn't do that and lost some credit, uh, even though they, they knew the concept of a control group. When asked to choose between two options, be sure you address both of them. That's the uh, blocking, which way to block and why. And follow the inference process for a significance test or a confidence interval free response question. That's the sort of three-step process that Mr. Wilcox showed you for confidence intervals or the four-step process that I've gone through for significance tests. And as always, we wanna keep building your confidence. And in order to do that, uh, we would love your feedback. Here is the tiny URL for uh, feedback where you can tell us what you uh, got from this session. Also, if you have any lingering questions you'd like us to think about addressing in one of our remaining two sessions, um, please go ahead and put it in there. We, we will definitely review those before I come back on for the big finale in session eight. So love to have your feedback there. Also, um, I wanna take the opportunity to mention to you that in session seven, Mr. Wilcox will be addressing the investigative task, the sort of outside the box uh, creative thinking question where you have to transfer the things you've learned in this course to an unfamiliar setting or where you have to put some things together in a new way. It's gonna be a really good session. And that one uh, investigative task question counts 12 and a half percent of the total exam score. So tomorrow's session is definitely worth uh, the price of admission, which is free. So I hope you'll join Mr. Wilcox for that one. And then session eight, uh, Mr. Wilcox and I will be back together to do our top 10 tips for you to have success on this year's AP exam. So we hope you'll come back and uh, see both of us for the finale in session eight. Thank you for taking time out. I know that your lives are, uh, are busy. Uh, we appreciate you uh, spending time with us and we hope to see you again in the next session. Thanks very much.